Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our fifth ESG and sustainability webinar. It's the fifth in a series of six, um, so welcome um, on a Friday, end of the week, so we're nearly in the weekend too. Um, as always, I've got with me Ashley Bleeker. So morning, Ashley. Good morning, all of um, So we'll be talking um, through our fifth webinar about reporting. Um, around preparing and finalising your sustainability report. And then our sixth uh, webinar next month, we'll talk about assurance or potential assurance over your ESG report. Uh, please don't start to stress, we are already working on a new series of sustainability webinars to keep you informed about all the latest and greatest. As you know, things are moving really fast in this space. Uh, so we won't stop in August and, and no longer keep you informed in some way. We are hoping to get some of our other, or confident, we are going to get some of our other ESG and sustainability partners involved. Um, so you're not stuck with Ashley and I indefinitely. Uh, we'll get Catherine Bell and Brett Spicer, et cetera, involved um, to educate you. And we should say to Aletta, if anyone has any suggestions for things that they would like covered uh, as part of continuing ESG webinars, we would love to hear from you. So if you think that there's a topic that's worth incorporating into any of these webinars, please let us know. Yeah, that would be fantastic. So you can email us or you can put it in the chat or in the survey afterwards. Please let us know and, and we'll find, um, if we don't know, we'll find somebody who knows and who can address the topic. I also wanted to flag today that BDO is sponsoring an ESG summit um, on the 27th of July. It is in Melbourne. Um, excitingly, one of our clients from Queensland is actually flying down to attend uh, the session. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a great day talking about all things sustainability and ESG. Um, so if you're interested in it, we've given you a link to find out more. Um, and join us. BDO will have a booth there. Ashley and I will be manning the booth with some of our other staff. So please come and say hello. Um, you know, we've been speaking on these webinars for some time. Please come and say hello. That would be great. Um, and then also at, at 11.20, um, there's a session on how to collect and manage quality ESG data. How do we promote transparency in ESG reporting? and how do you benchmark your ESG performance? And we've got some people who've done this. You can see there at Officeworks, for examples, for example, and I'll be moderating that session. So really looking forward to that session. Again, please um, um, look at this and, and come and say hello, come and join us and come and ask some questions. So for those people who don't get enough of a letter once a month for one hour on <laughs> webinars, here's another hour that you can come and listen to her moderator session for. I reckon, Ashley, people will now say I'm definitely not coming. We've had yeah. enough. But <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't organised the go-to webinar for that session. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but anyway, if you don't want to listen to the South African accent anymore, come and speak to Ashley um, at our booth. So back to today's session, when we look at the ESG roadmap, and as you know, we've been talking about this ESG roadmap throughout our webinar series. And here it is again. So in our ESG roadmap, we've said in step one, we assess, we look at the current state of ESG activities in an organisation. Um, and I think uh, we found that there's a lot of things that organisations are already doing, um, not um, with thinking they're doing it for ESG or sustainability, but doing it for good business practices and, and business reasons. So we try and find all of that throughout the organisation. And in step two, we talked about how do we um, do a materiality assessment, how do we engage with our stakeholders, etc. Then we had a session on talking about uh, leveraging our current initiatives to develop a strategy. So how do we uh, align um, the outcomes from what our stakeholders want with what we currently do and what are the missing bits? Uh, in step four and webinar four last month, we actually talked about measuring and we talked about that internal reporting to management. So we management can measure on an ongoing basis in order to achieve continuous improvement. 
So today we get into the fifth step where we talk about reporting, preparing and finalizing the sustainability report. Um, so you know you have to agree your format, your content, etc. I think it's a it's a good time to maybe just sit back and say when we started with this process, um, we had rough timelines lined out on what should be happening across the next um, at that stage next six months in order to prepare and finalize a sustainability report by the end of September or October this year to go out with your audited financial statements for 30 June 2022. Now speaking to clients I think a lot of people have said this is interesting um, we want to do it we committed to doing it we want to start we want to activate um, but there's a lot of other things going on. You know, we're still struggling to get people back from home um, to come to the office. We're struggling with the latest wave of COVID. There's a lot of other priorities. And, and maybe this has been a little bit on the back burner. We've attended education, but, you know, to, to really get started, it's been difficult. And therefore, we don't think we're going to achieve that uh, September or October deadline to issue our first sustainability report with um, our annual financial statements. Um, and, and that's a reality, and I think it's true for many of our attendees, and that's okay. What we're trying to do today is maybe articulate that if that is the case for you, it's not the end of the world. However, there are certain requirements and certain things that will have to be done. Um, in order to satisfy your directors and your auditors around your 30 June 2022 financial statements. So there's a clear indication from our regulators, from our standard setters, um, that consideration should be given to sustainability and ESG risks and opportunities um, and how it interacts with financial statements. So upfront, you might be working towards that first sustainability report, which is fantastic. Or you might be saying, um, we'll do it next year this time. Um, or and the third category, we might have to get something linked to our financial statements as soon as possible. So, Aletta, just so I'm clear, are you saying that if I've chosen to defer my sustainability report, are you saying that I'm not off the hook? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. You've just said it much better <laughs> than I could ever say it, Ashley, as always, and you're right. So if you've decided to defer, you're not off the hook. Right. Listen today, we're gonna to tell you why you're not off the okay. hook and, and how we can help. Um, so when we look at ESG and sustainability uh, reporting, we've always said this is all about progress and continuous improvement. And last month's webinar, we said the whole idea of reporting has two parts to it. There's internal reporting to management, so they can monitor, adjust, improve and we think dashboards and continuous um, the updated dashboards would be a good way to do that and then obviously we've got the external reporting to stakeholders which will happen annually um, and that's what we'll focus on today is this external part if you're interested in the internal part and the dashboards last month's webinar would be a good one um, before we look at the sustainability report, I thought it's a good time to maybe just reflect on the increasing, increasing focus on greenwashing. Um, so, you know, we've talked all along that we're doing, or many of our attendees are doing their first sustainability report or trying to activate to get to that first sustainability report. We're doing a baseline report um, and therefore, articulating what you are already doing in your business is really important. Um, and then we said maybe going forward, we could start to think on what you want to achieve in future. Maybe start to think about developing targets. Maybe start to think of publishing those targets. But important from a greenwashing perspective is that we make sure that if we go out and report targets, um, to our stakeholders, that we can back it up with programs, initiatives, strategy, strategies to actually realistically be able to achieve those targets. Um, so we cannot put very ambitious targets out into the market and out to stakeholders if we don't have the plans behind it 
to give us a chance to 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 achieve those. Um, so I think one should be aware of that. Um, talking about these regulators, now we know in Australia we don't have laws requiring a ESG and sustainability reporting. Um, you know where the US and Europe is much more advanced. Um, but we do have our regulators, so ASIC, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, um, put out their focus areas every year. And these focus areas for 30 June reporting, and this is financial reporting, but in this focus areas, they specifically refer to um, the fact that our operating and financial review, the OFR, should complement the financial report and tell the story of how the entity's business are impacted by COVID-19 and non-COVID factors. Um, and it, you know, the underlying drivers of the results and positions should be explained, and this is important, as well as risks, management strategies, and future prospects. <coughs> Sorry. So forward-looking information should have a reasonable basis. So that's the greenwashing aspect. Forward-looking information, any forward-looking information, but we should think ESG, sustainability, climate risk, all that information should have a reasonable basis and the market should be updated through continuous disclosures if circumstances change. And then they've also put out a regulatory guide um, where they talk about the operating and financial review. Now you'll see if you consider um, the ASIC uh, publication, and I've got a link there, they recommend that in the operating and financial review, organisations consider the impact of climate risk on um, the financial statements. And if you don't put it in the financial statements, um, at least refer to it and explain in the operating and financial review. So this operating and financial review, by the way, um, if we look at the findings from ASIC inspections over the last uh, 12 months, uh, the number one area um, has been um, impairment and number two, information disclosed in operating and financial review. Um, so it's, it's definitely a focus area for them. Uh, so ASIC is saying we have to consider this, we have to disclose it. Um, they go further in that media release and they talk about um, that the OFR, the Operating Financial Review, should explain the underlying drivers of the results and the financial position. So it's the second bullet point on the left, as well as risks, management strategies, future prospects. Um, they say all significant factors should be included and given appropriate prominence. Um, so if climate risk is a significant factor in your future performance, it should given, be given appropriate prominence. Um, if supply chain or if data privacy or if cybersecurity, if those factors, um, even though there's not a draft standard on those aspects, if that is a significant risk uh, factor for your business, that should be given appropriate prominence. Um, so it's really important that um, entities consider for our business, our business model, what are our risks? So it's entity specific. It's not you can just have pro forma disclosures. On the right hand side, I've also said they specifically refer to ESG risk. So they say the most significant business risk at whole of entity level that could affect the achievement of the disclosed financial performance or outcomes should be provided, including a discussion of environmental, social, and governance risks. So it's specifically mentioned in the focus areas of ASIC. And then the last bullet point on the right hand side, climate risk, climate change risks could have a material impact on future prospects of entities. And directors may also consider whether to disclose information that would be relevant under the recommendations of the task force on climate related financial disclosures, so the TCFD. Interestingly, the ASIC further on in this announcement also referred to this is an area that's changing fast. Standard setting is changing fast. Um, we know there's a new standard setting body around International Sustainability Standards Board. 
um, and therefore, and we know the TCFDs are aligned with that, uh, therefore, you know, you should be aware of all those latest developments. So a real push um, by ASIC. ASIC then also goes out and makes different statements in different publications around greenwashing. So they say greenwashing is the practice of misrepresenting the extent to which a financial product or an investment strategy or financial statements um, is environmentally friendly, sustainable or ethical. It's a misrepresentation of that. Um, and then they said ASIC actually undertook a greenwashing review. Um, of a sample of superannuation and investment products, and they've identified some areas for improvement. And these are the things they thought um, superannuation and investment entities could, you know, be more clear on. Use clearer labels, uh, you know, define the sustainability terminology they use, because we know they are not clear standards, um, and clearly explain how sustainability considerations are factored into their strategy. Um, so you can see it's not just in financial reporting, um, but ASIC is quite holistically looking at potential misrepresentation around ESG and sustainability. Um, another thing that ASIC's done, they've issued an information sheet, <coughs> um, information sheet 271, um, where they're trying to provide guidance on how to avoid greenwashing um, when offering or promoting sustainability-related products. And again, they refer to the recommendation to improve the quality of disclosure uh, by complying with the TCFD framework. Um, so again, an encouragement from the regulator. A really interesting report. Uh, ASIC also published a report where they've looked at climate risk disclosure by Australia's listed companies. So I've given you a link there to the report and then just a screen grab of the front page of the report. And very interestingly, um, they focused on climate risk disclosures. They've looked at 60 listed companies in the ASX 300. Um, they've also looked at 25, um, at that stage, recent IPO prospectuses, because they, um, you know, again, we have some forward-looking information. And they've looked at across 15,000 annual reports. And they've come up with some findings and recommendations. Now, these are snapshots of the report. It's a very interesting read. Um, but if you look at the key findings, they said 17% of listed entities in their sample identified climate risk as a material risk in their operating and financial review. And we've talked about OFRs earlier. Um, in general, as opposed to specific risk disclosures, is not useful for assessing climate risk exposures. Um, so, you know, you have to be quite um, specific. Uh, they found fragmented climate risk disclosure practices, uh, which is making comparisons between different entities difficult. Um, they said the majority of the ASX 100 com companies in their sample um, had in some extent considered climate risk to the company's um, uh, business, which is good. However, um, there is limited climate risk related disclosure outside the ASX 200. And then they said a number of listed companies intend to adopt the recommendations of the TCFDs. Um, so you can see the top end ASX 100, it's quite good. And then it drops off below that. Um, some of the key recommendations for listed companies, um, you know, is to, for directors and officers of listed companies should adopt a pro, a probative and proactive approach to emerging risks, um, that they should develop and maintain strong and effective corporate governance, which we've talked about. Um, there's a reference to Regulatory 247, which we've just talked about. Uh, around disclosure in the operating and financial review. Um, and then the final one, disclose useful information to investors. So specific disclosures is more, more useful than general disclosures. So we don't want boilerplate disclosures, specific disclosures based on your business, your business model, 
um, a risk that's significant to your business, and that's what the TCFDs are all about. So again, you can see ASIC is already reviewing, coming up with trends, identifying areas for improvement. So we know um, ASIC, it's, it's, it's a big focus. The reports today, the studies have been at the listed entity level, but as we've talked about, um, in Australia, we are seeing um, that the need by stakeholders to require information is driven by access to capital and access to markets and access to people. Um, so it's not just regulators interested, um, maybe they're just doing a bit of research, but we know our people want to see these disclosures, our staff, uh, we know our clients, our customers want to see this disclosure, um, and, and also um, when people consider giving us money, <coughs> access to capital, these are the disclosures they're looking at. Another one to look at is APRA, uh, so the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority um, issued a practice guide around climate change financial risks, and again, a focus on um, TCFDs, um, and so we suggest that you know your um, disclosures should be aligned with TCFDs. I just wanna maybe just flag, a lot of these regulators refer to TCFDs because when they came up with these practice guides, uh, there were no International Sustainability Standards Board, which was only established at the end of last year. And we know the TCFD recommendations are already included in the exposure drafts issued by the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, so if you are complying with TCFDs and or complying with the exposure drafts issued by the International Sustainability Standards Board, especially standard S2, uh, we know it's basically the same thing, um, more or less word for word the same thing. Um, I think it's important to look at what uh, um, the ASX is saying, and they've issued in February 2019 and fourth um, edition of the Corporate Governance Principles and Recommendations, and in there as well, in um, Recommendation 7.4, uh, they refer to um, disclosing uh, risks, climate-related risks by reference to the TCFD recommendations. Again, this publication predates the establishment of the International Sustainability Standards Board, uh, but another recommendation to follow the TCFD disclosures. And then finally, the Australian Accounting Standards Board in April this year issued an exposure draft um, on um, the new standards issued by the International Sustainability Standards Board. Uh, comments um, are due on the 15th of July, which is today, around the first uh, standard, disclosure standard, around the general requirements, as well as the climate-related disclosures. But in this exposure draft, they only re also recommend disclosure currently with the TCFDs, obviously, as well as uh, the future standards after this ED. So we can see in Australia, although we don't have mandated laws and regulations, there is a strong movement of recommendations by various regulators around disclosing um, sustainability and ESG information. And a warning to consider and be careful of greenwashing. If we move on and look at delivering your sustainability report, um, we want to look at four aspects in particular. So the first one is where to report sustainability information, which I think is a critical question. And then we move on to, so what is the content, what is the format, and who needs to be involved? Um, and, and Questions two, three, and four really flows from the answer to where to report your sustainability information. Um, so if we look at where to report sustainability information, um, I thought I'll do a bit of a recap on what do we believe the reporting options are. Um, so, you know, often we talk about financial report and we talk about financial statements and some people Actually, a lot of people use financial report and financial statements interchangeably. That includes me, by the way. So I make this mistake all the time. <laughs> and, and we have a long-standing fight about that. Actually, you've done it again. But anyway, 
I think it's important to clarify this. Um, an annual financial report, and Ashley Sayaleta, that's what you always call a glossy, but an annual financial report consists of um, basic um, uh, components, and those basic components are stipulated by Section 295 of the Corporations Act. And then there's other components, which are more voluntary in nature. Um, so if you look at the left-hand side, the basic things that are required um, by Section 295 of the Corps Act, the first part is financial statements. Um, the second part is uh, the director's declaration around the financial statements, that it's true and fair in compliance with accounting standards. And thirdly, there's an audit report on those financial statements. Um, so the financial statements uh, would be your profit and loss, your balance sheet, your cash flow statement, your notes to the financial statements. All right, those are the financial statements, the basics that are that are required. The directors have to make a declaration over those statements. Auditors have to provide an opinion over those financial statements. All right, but if we move outside of that and we look to the other parts of the financial report, we find there's a director's report which can include, um, for listed entities, should include a remuneration report. There's an operating and financial review. We hear that again. There could be a sustainability report. There could be a, a TCFD report. There could be a corporate governance uh, statement. Um, there can be a chairman's report. All other piece of information in that same annual financial report. I should, I should say I asked the letter to put this slide in for my benefit because I was always making mistakes with the correct terminology for a lot of these things and we've spoken to some clients about these issues. So um, hopefully this helps other people understand how all these things hold together because I was often using the terms financial statements and financial report uh, interchangeably and they're clearly not. So um, hopefully this gives a little bit of guidance for people like me that don't necessarily understand this stuff. <laughs> So Ashley would say later, why do I care about this? You do care about this because if you put your climate risk disclosures in your financial statements as required by the Corps Act, then your director's declaration will have to address that and be happy that it's true and fair. And very important, your audit report uh, will consider all those disclosures. So it's subject to audit. However, if you have your climate risk disclosures or your sustainability information in the OFR or the sustainability report, which is still part of the annual financial report, those aspects are not specifically subject to audit, but because they're part of this package, which is called the annual financial report, your auditor of the financial statements will still read them to consider whether there are inconsistencies between those documents and what they've just audited in the financial statements. Right, so it's not the auditor won't audit it, but they would read it and consider and look out for potential inconsistencies. So I think it's important that we decide where do we want to put our information? Do we want to put it in the financial statements subject to audit? Or do we want to put it somewhere in the annual report? Um, where it goes out at the same time, or do we want to put it completely outside what we've got on this diagram? The reason I believe it should at least be in the annual financial report at the same time is because there's an interrelationship between the information in your financial statements, um, the value of your assets, the potential impairment of assets, the useful life of assets, your um, restoration and decommissioning liabilities and your assessment of climate risk, etc. But anyway, that leads us to, I think there, th there are three key um, ESG reporting options. Um, first, you can have it as part of your published and your audited financial statements. Um, secondly, it could be part of that broader financial report, as we've explained on the previous diagram. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and remember, ASIC is strongly recommending that in that OFR, you address climate-related risks. So I would say 
if it's not in the audited financial statements, it should as a minimum be somewhere in that broader financial report to satisfy the recommendations of the various regulators. And then thirdly, it could be completely outside the report. So it could be issued um, at another date, just on the website, etc. But then you lose that link with the financial statements. Um, so that's just a few of the options. So a polling question. We thought, um, you know, I've been going on for so long and I'm exhausted. Let's get some input from you. So which reporting model um, are you following? So give us some feedback. Um, so that's just the three that I'll let us just run through there. So first one, part of the financial statement. Second one, part of the broader financial reporting pack. Or thirdly, an independent report that sits outside of the broader financial reporting pack. Um, and then again, we've worded this to say, if you've already done it, or you're likely to do it, or you haven't produced your first one yet, um, knowing what you know today, and of course, everyone's been listening incredibly carefully to what Aletta's just gone through in the last 10 minutes. Which one do you think is most appropriate for your business and importantly for your stakeholders? So the people that want to read about this, where should they expect to see this and what level, I suppose, of certainty do they want to see over the sustainability report? Well, thank you very much to those people who've already voted. It would be really fantastic if you could share your views. Um, obviously, when we close the poll, we'll, we'll share uh, that with all our attendees. I always enjoy these polls because we sometimes have some ideas, um, personal ideas. Um, some of our ideas are formed by what we see in our client base, uh, but it's always good to test that with a, a broader a community. So thank you very much for participating. I don't like it. It doesn't let me vote. Oh, you're not allowed to vote. I know what your personal view is, so no <laughs> voting for you, Ashley. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everybody, for participating. And I'll share the results now. Um, and there you'll see 21% um, said part of the published audited financial statements, um, which is amazing. 47% part of that broader financial reporting pack. 32% uh, is a completely independent report outside the annual report. So we've got a, a good spread across um, the whole, uh, all three alternatives. Um, the only thing I would say for the third group that have the independent report outside of the financial report is to consider how they, um, uh, whatever's in that report, to what extent it would impact the financial statements um, and how do they satisfy um, the directors and the auditors that they've considered it when they've prepared the financial statements. Um, I think it's a harder um, sell on, yes, we've considered it, but how have you considered it? Um, might be a bit harder, but absolutely fantastic that you, you, are, at, you are doing a independent sustainability report. So thank you very much for that. That's amazing. All right. So then um, I've, I've mentioned earlier, we believe um, that there's a interconnectivity between financial and sustainability reporting. And, and we know that ASIC, the ASX, APRA, the ASB is saying as a result of that interconnectivity, we would like you to consider uh, the climate risk and the other ESG risk and how it impacts financial statements. So Ashley, I'll hand to you to, as an example, talk through climate change and how that links to financial statements. You'll, you'll notice a difference in slides, whereas my slides didn't have pictures on them because I'm not too good with words. And so we've just spent the last kind of 10 or 15 minutes on the thing that Aletta's truly passionate about, as you can probably tell. <laughs> so we're slightly behind schedule. So this will just be a two minute segue for you. So, <laughs> so, so the, 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 thing, the, the thing to take away from this is the role that climate change risks have across broader financial risks, right? And you've probably already seen people talk about climate risk in these three buckets. You've got the physical risks of climate change, you've got the transition risks of climate change, 
and then you've got the liability risks of climate change and you can see the subcategories there but that's a common way so that one's out of the APRA um, practice guide but you will have seen um, various uh, infographics displayed in information like that. I suppose the thing to think about from a risk management perspective or from a reporting perspective is the compounding effect that each of these risks has on an organisation or on an organisation's other kind of enterprise-wide risks, right? So credit risk becomes an issue when you're looking at potential increases in defaults on loans because of houses or businesses being affected by adverse climate events. Um, you've also got issues about assets and their collateral if they're declining in value. You've got market risk, right? It's, you, you've got the potential repricing of financial instruments or um, debt or the value of securities. You've got operational risk, particularly around supply chain disruption, uh, forced facility closures. You've got insurance risk, uh, you know, potential increase in insured losses as a result of extreme weather events. Obviously, flooding is a great example for many of us at the moment. Uh, you've got liquidity risk, uh, you know, the demand for liquidity, again, responding to extreme weather events, um, and you've got reputational risk. You know, and this, this plays out in relation to customers, uh, but it also plays out in relation to employees, so your employee value proposition. So you can see that there is a, a direct link between climate change risk and what we would otherwise see as broader um, portfolio risks within each business. So just to take that slightly further, you know, and, and a lot of this is about managing um, risk because um, even though um, the extent to which specific risks materialise is uncertain, we know that there's a high degree of certainty that a lot of these, um, or that some of these financial risks will materialise as a result of climate change. Again, this is from the APRA practice notes, just a, a nice way to explain all of this. What's important, and this comes up under the G in ESG governance from a risk management perspective, what's important here is that what, what organisations are expected to do is to be able to mitigate the magnitude of these risks through you know, appropriate governance, appropriate risk management, appropriate reporting disclosure scenario analysis. These are the different levels of the TCFD framework. Um, and, and also use it to capitalise on opportunities. Uh, and so APRA's view and, and all we think all of our views should be the best way to manage these kind of climate risks is to manage them in the context of the, of the institution's overall business strategy and risk appetite at an ERP level. And that obviously has implications for how you report on these things um, and how you manage them and what you say about your governance processes around these things when you're producing a sustainability report. So hopefully that kind of explains the, the connection between these two. Aleta, do you want to continue on from there? Yes. So we've said that these ESG sustainability risks um, ultimately flows through to financial impacts. It's got other impacts as well, but it also has financial impacts. And therefore, when we look at this interconnectivity between accounting frameworks and sustainability frameworks, we can see, if you look at sustainability frameworks in isolation, um, and if you look at accounting frameworks in isolation, um, you might miss the bigger picture. Uh, if you put the two together, you see there's overlap and there's many topics that actually is part of sustainability and impacts the broader sustainability uh, messaging and strategy for an organisation, but also impact uh, accounting frameworks, impact value of assets, um, impact liabilities, impact risk, um, the ability to collect debts, etc. Um, so I think we should understand that there's these overlap, there's that link um, in practice, uh, and therefore we also see that overlap when we look at the frameworks. Now, if you look at a, a particular example, um, if you take an, an example of an entity that uses coal power plants, which may become decommissioned due to government policy, um, there are sustainability frameworks um, that would um, require disclosure of that. There's the sustainability disclosure standards, there's disclosures of risk arising from the, the, the entity's reliance on coal power uh, plants, and there's transition risks, etc. But then if you look on the other side in the accounting world, there's the potential uh, change in government policy, which could be an indicator of impairment, 
and it would result in the asset being written down, or we could argue if we don't impair the asset now, it at least has a much shorter useful life. We can't depreciate it over the next 30 years, we'll have to depreciate it, let's say, over five years. Um, so you can see that both angles have to be addressed, and that's why we believe in this holistic communication and putting this all together so we can clearly articulate how one thing, the fact that the entity uses power plants, impacts sustainability and impacts financial statements. So that leads us to the expectation gap. So investors, you know, what invest, the expectation gap is what investors want and what IFRS accounting standards require, it's not necessarily the same thing. So this is a really hard thing for me to talk about because I love accounting standards and I'm now acknowledging in front of all of you that those beautiful accounting standards do not include all the information that investors want. And it's because the accounting standards um, you know, is, is, is just a, a looking at certain aspects. So some investors and regulators believe that the effects of climate change are not appropriately uh, reflected. Um, so they say that overlap is insufficient um, to just disclose certain ESG things in financial statements is not enough because we miss all the other things. All right, so, um, you know, they think it's got an impact on um, audit quality and it's got an impact on the, um, you know, the adequacy or inadequacy of financial requirements. So it's really just a continuation. So all these sustainability frameworks are actually there to complement and further enhance uh, the accounting frameworks to get a holistic view um, and a holistic communication of uh, the uh, risks faced by an organisation and also the opportunities. Um, and that's what investors want to see. Um, some of the uh, comments uh, that's been received from investors, um, you know, some have been saying in the PRI report that they feel as if they're flying blind. There's a, glare, a glaring absence of climate risk in financial reporting. Um, they've said 70% of high polluting companies that they've reviewed are not or are only partially accounting for climate re related risks. Um, there was also a, a Saracen and Partners campaign and there was a, a letter to the big four in the, in the UK and there's also a, a copy being sent to the Financial Reporting Council in the UK um, where they call for the company financial statements to be clear, clearer and closer aligned uh, to the Paris Agreement. Uh, um, and then, you know, they say because um, that Paris Agreement and the commitments in the Paris Agreement is material for investors, it should be a material um, for financial reporting and therefore th um, for IFRS standards. And again, they come back to there's an expectation gaps. Um, you know, there's an apparent difference between what investors would like to see and what standards require. And this is just focusing on the expectation gap around climate change. And I think one could make a case that there's an expectation gap and a broader expectation gap than just of climate change and therefore we need these sustainability standards. So Ashley, I'll hand over to you to talk about the ESG report. So wherever you are on the spectrum, whichever format you decide on, let's talk about some of the fundamentals around content, etc. And, and I should say too, that although we obviously make observations about the expectations, that there are a myriad of organisations that are producing fantastic sustainability reports with lots of very clear, um, consistent, transparent information in them, um, so a, a significant proportion which also have limited assurance over them. So this is not a, a, a kind of a bashing up of organisations about their sustainability commitments. Um, and what we'll share with you in a minute is some great examples of sustainability reports. But there are a lot of organisations um, that are doing great things around their reporting requirements here. Okay, so, uh, so, so you might have seen uh, some of this content before, but so the first thing is in determining the content is the stakeholder engagement piece, which we've talked about in the context of materiality assessment. So, so we go out and we talk to our stakeholders and we ask them what's important, right? To do that, we obviously need to assess 
um, their level of interest in sustainability issues and their level of influence over our business. And we talked about that four part matrix of stakeholders before, which will govern the way that you engage with them and the amount of time and energy you put into ascertaining their views. What that produces is this materiality uh, matrix and it shows uh, various sustainability issues that are important to your stakeholders, factored for how important those stakeholders are and the importance to your business. I've chosen a, a real life example here from the Clean Away Sustainability Report just because I think it's a really, a really good way to visually represent mm. it and they very clearly identify those issues in the top right hand corner that are important to them as a business but are clearly important to their stakeholders mm. as well. And they have a lot more information in their report and again, you know, if you want to have a look at a good report, have a look at the Clean Away Sustainability Report, I think it's excellent. So that's, so that's the first bit, which is what do our stakeholders care about? Once you have a look at that, the next thing to then consider is what framework should we report under, if any? And we've talked to you about many of these before. Uh, the the pretty, pretty boxes in the bottom right hand corner, the UN SDGs uh, have been very popular. They may be getting slowly eclipsed by other frameworks. We've talked to you about the TCFD framework. GRI has been uh, incredibly popular and probably will continue to be so. Uh, and we've obviously talked to you about the growing uh, influence of the IFRS Foundation and the formulation of the International Sustainability Standards Board, which is what the letter's been talking about. So once you choose your framework, the question is how do you marry up various issues important to you and your stakeholders to those frameworks? Because this is not about reporting under every piece of a framework, mm -hmm. it's about picking the parts of a framework that are relevant to your business and your stakeholders. So once you've done that, then you've got to think about what kind of commitments you're going to be making around each of these pieces of the puzzle. What do we do in relation to E? What do we do in relation to S? And what do we do in relation to G? Now, one thing that's important to note is when you get to reporting, you don't have to produce a, a report that follows this format. Some reports do follow this format. Other reports follow a different format where they identify say, the strategic pillars within the business and they report under the relevant ESG commitments or sustainability commitments that relate to each of those sustainability pillars. And we'll show you one of those in a minute. So that's the, that's the formulative work that you need to do to agree the content of the report. Mm. And so the question then is once you agree the content, what does the format look like? And as I said before, the format can change or vary and it's free for an organisation to choose what format they use. But the general rule of thumb is within each part of your sustainability report, you would look to, you would look to provide some form of quantitative information. So what data do we have and what targets are we aiming for? Some qualitative information where you talk about What's, what you're doing in that space, what challenges you're having, what successes you've had, what you're looking to in the future. And often what you'll also see to help you bring it to life for the reader is some kind of case study in each of those areas. So there's typically three parts to any of these sustainability report formats. There's the quantitative information, the qualitative information and a case study to bring it to life. You don't have to do it that way, that's just how a lot of people do it. So in terms of inspiration, uh, we've shared some of these with you previously in early webinars, but we just thought we'd pick a few. So um, the reason that we always seem to focus on Coles and Woolies is because they've done a huge amount of work in this space and they have a really clever way of communicating with their readers, uh, which can be uh, customers, employees, uh, or any of their other stakeholders, including investors and things like that. But um, as you will have seen, Coles has this uh, together to zero and better together approach and their sustainability report follows that kind of approach. It doesn't follow an E and S and G approach. Uh, and uh, there's some examples there. Um, the Woolworths uh, report, which is uh, one that a letter loves, which is really cool. You know, they, it's all formulated under this idea of a sustainability tree. Uh, and they have three sections in their report. They have people, planet and product, mm. and all of their sustainability commitments, you can see mm. there, sit within one of those three buckets. Mm. And so there, there's an example of three buckets, not E, S and G, but people, planet and product. And that works well for what Woolworths wants to communicate to the market. Um, the other one, again, just to draw on the Clean Away report, again, Clean Away has this whole idea of strategic pillars and how they create value. And so they report under their strategic pillars. You can see that they've got people, earth, 
markets, assets, financials. They also add in another one, which is community in the report. So they actually have six themes to their report. And again, they, they adopt that format under each, which mm -hmm. is what's our quantitative communication and what's our qualitative communication and what case studies do we have to back it up. Uh, just running through some more inspiration for you if you need it. Uh, you can report very simply on various uh, environmental issues. So uh, ResMed very simply reports on paper consumption. I really like this just because A, it's quantitative, but B, it's incredibly simple to understand. Mm. So that's a really um, useful one to look at if you're after simplicity. Uh, and then uh, you can see, um, moving on to some social type issues, uh, from the Charter Hall report, again, I really like this format because they identify the specific theme and then in relation to their theme, whether it's employee engagement or otherwise, they provide you with information around their quantitative achievements. They tell you what they're aiming for in the following year, an FY22 target, and then they tell you about a longer term target that they're aiming for mm. as well. I, I really like that format mm. personally. Uh, uh, again, uh, if you look at the NAB uh, annual review, NAB has a lot of uh, qualitative information in the way that, so they write about what they're doing, which is totally fine. They also have links to various specific other documents that contain more information. Mm. You'll see a lot around reconciliation action plans in various different reports. Uh, but that's that, that example there just shows you a, a, a more of a qualitative approach to this. Uh, and then again, BHP does the same thing. This is, a, I suppose, a governance example, but one of the reasons is there's just so much within the BHP sustainability function that it kind of gets farmed out to different areas. So you can see here that they put in links about the sustainability committee, about the remuneration committee, about the risk and audit committee, um, and about a whole bunch of other things, the form on corporate responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then another example, just under governance is from the CBRE, uh, report. This is just how they talk about modern slavery and what they're doing about managing some of the risks in there and some of the programs that they have in place as well. So they're just some examples of how you can think about a format that might work for your business. Again, once you agree what it is you're going to put in there, there's different ways to describe it, but the, the most common format is some kind of quantitative expression, some, type, some kind of qualitative expression and some kind of case study. Uh, to bring both of those concepts to life. So question then is, okay, who gets involved to make this thing happen? And again, we've touched on some of these issues before, but the reality is this is a firm-wide or organisation-wide initiative. And so while you've got data owners, um, you've also got other people involved in this process. And so across that ESG spectrum, the data is going to come from pretty much every part of the business. A lot of people information will come from HR, a lot of supply chain information will come from the operations team, uh, a lot of uh, information around technology will come from the IT team, also from procurement. A lot of the risk stuff comes from the risk management function, a lot of the customer engagement will come from the sales team, and then a lot of your performance in and around how you track these things at a balance sheet level will come from the finance team. Notwithstanding the data owners, creating this report needs a whole bunch of other input, okay? so. There's got to be a narrative that's wrapped around all of this. And so normally what you would see is an ESG champion within a business that is the driver of some kind of narrative. Then there's the actual writing of the report. And so that typically involves some kind of communications expertise because these are big documents containing a lot of information. And the real challenge is how do we, how do we communicate the key concepts to our readers simply? So a lot of time and energy goes into how to set this out and what to say, rightly so in my opinion, because this is all about how well we communicate with our stakeholders. Mm. And so that's a really important part of the process. Mm. Then how do we get it to our stakeholders? Who needs to read it? Who do we want to read it? And which bits do we want them to remember? There's a really big role for marketing and all that. And ultimately someone's got to drive it, right? And I suppose what we've seen is people struggle if they don't get the board or some other key member of the leadership team involved in making sure this happens. So within our own business at the moment, our board is heavily invested uh, in this. Uh, and so our board has, has asked to see a draft of our sustainability report in I think about six or eight weeks time or letter. Uh, and so it's really important to have someone driving the process and taking responsibility for it. So that is a full court press. Everyone in, well, not everyone, but almost every part of an organisation is involved in actually producing the final sustainability report for your business. 
some things to think about when you're trying to, to, I suppose, address this issue in your business, which is who is actually going to be the ESG champion within your organisation? Where are they most likely um, going to come from? Which department, which person, which level of seniority? Many organisations have a chief sustainability officer or a sustainability manager. Uh, and then typically there's someone else at an exec level or within the board who, who ends up being the champion as well. And then the other things to think about is managing the process. So as you're building a report, it's really important to think about which group is going to be the strongest in helping get this over the line. Where, is there, where are there going to be challenges along the way? Are there some data owners that are going to really struggle to get you the data that you want? And if so, how do you engage them early? How do you support them? How do you help them? And then thinking clearly about what kind of risk management steps you're going to put in place to do that. Are you going to, are you going to hold hands? Are you going to have people meet regularly? Are you going to escalate these things up the chain so that you get what you want when you need it? Um, who resolves deadlocks? If there's a disagreement among the team about a particular strategic direction to take, who ultimately has the call on it? Working out all these things beforehand and having specific risk management steps in place will help you stick to your timeline as you start to do all of this. Actually, I think we are at the end of our allocated time and somehow we've managed to get there. I think you've done a brilliant job because I went over time, I get so excited about reporting as I always do. And so thank you for speeding it up and getting us through all of that. If you need any um, assistance, um, we've got um, TCFD online training and it's for free. You can go on our website and work through that. I think that's really useful and um, to give you a bit of an overview. So there's a whole course and I've got the link there. And that's really important that TCFD reporting to have in your OFR as part of your financial report um, because the auditors and ASIC and the regulators would want to see that. Um, if you want to read more about sustainability, we are issuing a monthly corporate reporting insights newsletter. Uh, I think in the June edition, we had six sustainability articles. A poor IFRS were down at the bottom um, of the pack. So I should be. Uh, no, no, no. I knew you were going to say that. Uh, but if you want to lead, read more, uh, please uh, go. Or uh, watch more videos of a letter. <laughs> or register for our corporate reporting insights. And on our BDO website, we've got a large number of publications, newsletter articles, videos, actually, and even these webinars and PowerPoint slides. And then our broader team, um, you know, we, in Perth, we've got Sharif and Catherine. We've got Brett Spicer, Dylan and Cherie in Brisbane, as well as Mark Cushing, Josh Carver in Adelaide, um, and Catherine Dean, Ian Hooper, in Sydney and then obviously Ashley and I are in, in Melbourne uh, and Phil Murdoch are there with Catherine and Sharif in Perth. So please feel free to reach out to any of us. If you go to that link, you can see contact details for all of us um, and in future they will be joining us for some of our webinars. I would like to say thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you found it informative. Please reach out if you need any help to include ESG sustainability in your 30 June 2022 financial reporting um, uh, pack, uh, or your financials, or obviously with the separate sustainability. But you're not off the hook if you don't, remember. Yes. There's still work to do. <laughs> There's still work to do to keep those auditors and those stakeholders and those regulators happy. So thank you very much. I hope you have a great day and weekend. Thanks, Alita.